Today we are talking about best puzzle books and this is coming up because in the dojo training program we want to know which books are the best so that we can put them in the program. We also want to have an eye to which books are best for which rating cohort. In addition, the dojo is compiling a list of its own puzzles, both tactical and positional in nature. And this discussion might help us clarify what we want that book to look like. I can say just trying to do that book and the effort it has required to do that thing is more than I expected. It gives me a deeper appreciation of just how hard it is to put a good puzzle book together. And so thinking about what a good puzzle book is will be part of the discussion. We will inevitably also talk about what are puzzles good for. Some people don't like them. Some people don't care. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and earlier today, I had the chance to talk to Ben Johnson of the Perpetual Chess Podcast, who is probably the most, along with uh, I am John Donaldson, he is the one person among the people I know who really know chess literature best. So it was really good to get his take on the best puzzle books. So we're bringing him in here. And David is not going to be giving his list. He's going to just be lurking on the sidelines. You can see him there lurking beside me. And he can explain why he's lurking, maybe even right now. David, why are you lurking, buddy? OK. Um, <clears throat> I think that uh, most chess puzzle books are created more or less equally. And so I can't really rank them the way Jesse would like me to. OK. Sorry, Jesse. That's OK. We're going to prove just have an open mind, maybe, when we talk about these puzzle books, because I can guarantee you that there is a huge difference in quality uh, in these books. Yeah, I me and Jesse are going to fight. I don't think he's going to be happy with my books. <laughs> <laughs> That's maybe he's not happy right now because I'm not going to give him picks that he can get mad about. Maybe maybe he needs that rage. And actually, something else that I want to say about this, we've done a lot of best books and best players and such. But especially with best books, uh, we had a kind of disagreement in earlier shows, like when we did best books of all time, about, well, uh, best book for whom? And... I kind of like to think that there are chess classics and they go across different rating bands and such. But more than any kind of book, I think certain puzzle books are better for certain groups of players, right? And so we'll definitely try to differentiate that as well. And Ben Johnson was great in terms of like, this book is good for this group, you know? So we'll get into that as well. So the, the best puzzle books of all time that comes with that caveat. Yeah. Although I don't really have any rankings. I do have some thoughts about what could potentially make books slightly better or slightly worse, mm -hmm. you know, so <laughs> let's hear them. I'll, let's get into I'll be it. sitting here. I mean, one example is just like the books should say on the cover 1600 to 2000 or 1400 to 1750 or 2100 to 2400. They should just, <laughs> just like basic, basic, basic labeling. Uh, but as you can see, like basically no book does that, right? So I can't use that to say that one book's better than another. It's just see, Cosi starting to get some ideas about what a good book might be. <laughs> well, by the end of the show, we might have a whole thing. We might yeah, get some okay. list. Well, there's room. There's room to expand the columns, so we can do it. we can do it. And um, I want to speak yeah. so when we go through this. I'm, I'm. We're allowed to change our minds. I might change my minds as we go. No, on. that's um, that's a big critique. I honestly do have of a lot of end game study books, um, mm. because in particular, some end game studies are just like impossibly difficult, and some are like solvable with a lot of effort, and some are are, are just solvable. And it's like, um, yeah, a lot of the books have puzzles arranged in just completely random orders, where you don't know if you're going to be suffering during the puzzle you know you'll be suffering but you don't know how long is it going to be a five minute or like a 30 minute and yeah it's very very tough especially for people that are just starting out if there's not a lot of like instruction here's how to solve puzzles here's how to look for solutions then you know it could be a real struggle for people starting off with books that are too hard for them because like david said there's no clear indicator generally that this book is going to be too hard for someone and People are often just Googling, oh, what are the best puzzle books? What are the best endgame books? They see the most popular books. And yeah, they don't really have 
any understanding of, of what's going to be too easy or, or too hard. So, um, mm. yeah, I don't want to name any names. I definitely see people on Twitter working with books that are like way above their rating range. And I'm like, oh, my God, this how did how did you get this book? That's not that's the not answer good. Is simple. People don't label their work. I mean, it's like it's like the very first, you know, 1000 <laughs> rated move for somebody to make a puzzle book would be to, you know, label the difficulty level for their audience but they'd rather sell five or six extra copies to people who can't use the book well than to just label it and sell it to the actual audience now hey, david me. now david let me just say that's not entirely true there's some truth to it but it's not entirely true we have books like in the program like tactics time that is clearly marketed to a lower rated audience right my first chess workbook first that's also marketed to a lower audience. Great. Right. I'm very glad more. that perfect that you your chess clearly out. meant for aspiring professional players, right? So mm, that's not a great one, Jesse. It's not. That's I know not a lot a great of one? I know a lot of amateurs buying perfect your chess because they're like, oh, okay. it's a good book, and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. We we label it that way. We know, and but, we put it in the correct in cohort. In that book, it is very clear that these saying the first problems starting out are like meant for 1900s. In the it's, book, yeah, that's they're true. in print. It's there okay. in print. It's not like you know. In any case, I we I think we're in agreement that the book um, should stay. Also, shout out to our friend Seychess. I'm pretty sure he started doing a series of tactic tactics books that are kind of labeled. I feel like they're called like climbing the tactics ladder, something like that. And I think they're given like every like 200 rating point band. So those seem to be like a pretty uh -huh. good. Maybe maybe we should check them out. <laughs> yeah, no, and I want to say actually with that book has helped uh, us think about what our book slash Kindle, whatever it's going to be, will look like in the sense that now because, you know, books can be digital, you can have a position on one page like say chess has and then the answer on the next. So if you're reading a Kindle, you're just flipping through and you don't have the burden of a book, which is, you know, you can't really do one problem on one page and then the answer on the other. Right. You yeah. could, but it's just going to cost a lot more to print. The print solutions it. are always together. And if you want to go check problem 18, you have to be very careful not to accidentally see the solution to problems 19 and 20 when you're right. exactly. looking it up right. and that all that whole problem yeah. mm -hmm. that we all used to have. OK, Costa, should we start, boss? We're going to snake it. I think um, let's let's get into it. So, yeah, just to be clear, I don't know if we actually explained it. We're each or Jesse and I are doing a top 10 ranking list. We have Ben's top 10 rankings from earlier. We're going to be going one by one. If you want a visual mm -hmm. representation and you're listening to this on the podcast, um, check out the video on on YouTube. And um, oh, I assume we'll have links to all the books that we mentioned today and they will probably be Amazon links. Um, we'll put them in the YouTube description. We'll put them in the like podcast description as well. It would really do us a solid if people would use those links. It doesn't cost people any extra money, but we'll get a very, very, very small percentage of, of Amazon's portions if you go through our link. It's grains of rice, people, grains of rice. But it would we would appreciate <laughs> it if you if you at least did your your chess book or any chess or any shopping through the the amazon affiliate links that would be um that would be great but yeah let's uh let's get into it <laughs> okay how about this i'll go first and then i'll give ben johnson's and then we'll snake or snake through Kostya. sounds good okay so i'm just gonna write it out here and um my first book number 10 here if i'm allowed to uh oh it's not letting me write in here there we go so it's calculation by Augard. And I kind of <laughs> flamed the book in uh, my review of it several years ago on our site. Um, and I, I, I might move it off. I might move it off, but it's a completely competent book. The problem with this book and then the next book I'm going to talk about by Augard is that it's computer driven, namely many of the positions there are Augard looking at, with the computer at a super GM's games and finding some move that the engine finds and then using that as a problem. To me, that's far less interesting than a move that somebody actually found or maybe found in the analysis without the computer because we are not computers. Okay, so that's my little spiel. And um, then here's a book. There's many books when I talked to Ben that I hadn't really 
heard of and I will check out. So this number, his number 10 is called 300 Problems by Lev Albert. Mm. And I've seen that I book. That's a good book. Okay, yeah. I had never even heard of that book. And uh, actually, think, excuse me, it's called 300 Positions. And um, so I, like in the last show we did with Ben, he mentioned several books I hadn't checked out. I went and checked them out. They were all winners. Uh, so there it is, 300 Positions. Lev Albert, what do you got for us, Coast? Um, okay, so yeah. It's honestly, super tough list. There, there's a lot of good puzzle books, um, and I might end up rearranging things um, a little bit. For me, my number ten choice right now is uh, the big one, five three three four, by uh, uh -huh. by Polgar. And you um, haven't even done it yet, boss. What do you mean I haven't done it? <laughs> you haven't done it, right? You haven't gone through it yet, Bows. Not like since we've started the program. I've had the book for, for many years and, and gone through um, huge, huge portions of it, you know. Okay. Hundreds of pages, hundreds of pages of that book. <laughs> dojo, let me just say that a huge conflict within the dojo is that David is too proud to read the book. And Coast needs to get on it. I'm happy to hear, though, that Coast has at least done some of it. Great book for visualization. I guess I'll end up talking more about it too. Um, All right, Coach, what's your number nine, Bob? Yeah, no, let me just say on this, this Polgar book, it's it's great. I mean, it's it has a lot more than just the mating puzzles too, which I don't know if we're giving it bonus points for that, but I actually like the book because it has all these like uh, miniatures and has all these like nice combinations as well. So definitely it's just like huge, huge value in, in that book. And the mating puzzles I think also are very fundamental and um and useful very bulky book though very very big i wish they would figure out uh some of the, you really got to get it on chessable too if they got that book on chessable game changer game changer right there um anyway number nine for me is a pretty famous in-game study book um domination uh -huh, I think it's good. called domination in 25 45 studies <laughs> something like that I always can't remember either how many it is. Yeah, by um, I think it's Kasparian, who's a big, big composer. Mm -hmm. So this is a classic book. I have mixed feelings about it because I, I really wouldn't recommend it to anyone that's not already like quite a strong player, like 2200 and up. Um, mm -hmm. Just because, so the book is great. It has a ton of studies. Like I uh, mentioned earlier with in-game study books, it has this problem where a lot of the studies are um, doable. A lot of them are just like extremely like difficult, borderline impossible. And there's little instruction in terms of like what you're looking for and like how to, you know, it's, so it's a slog. It's a slog to go through the book, but um, the puzzles are amazing. A lot of strong GMs, like they credit this book because like they went through it, they solved a bunch of end game studies and, you know, improved their calculation tremendously. And it is a classic. So I feel like it deserves its place on, on this list. Yeah, I mean, what are you looking for on the list, Kostya? Like books that are useful to lots of people or books that are well done for what they are? Or like what, wh can you give us any insight into your, your criteria for ranking? Um, yeah, so for, for me, my criteria is basically just, um, I'm just trying to focus on the, the best books that I've come across. They're definitely going to be books that like either I personally studied or spent more time with. Um, even though there's just like tons of good books out there, let's say for, for lower levels that I just haven't um, interacted much with. Um, so yeah, for me, it's going to be like a mix. They're definitely going to be on the stronger side. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just looking for just like the best books overall that I've, that I've seen. Right. And maybe I'll just add for myself, uh, I am only listing books that had a personal connection to me that I felt made me a better player that maybe also I found some aesthetic beauty in. This is why Johnson's picks, Ben Johnson's picks are especially useful for us because he's thinking of it more from the perspective of, let's call it global chess improvement, right, from down the line. Um, and that would line up better with sort of the perspective of our training program as far as which books you would want to put in the training program. Well, right. And so, one, yeah, one of the reasons I want to do this podcast is so we get our heads around both like which books we might uh, bring into the program and then our own book and how it should be structured uh, as well. 
yeah. Um, okay, so uh, speaking of Ben Johnson, he has a book here that I'm interested if you guys have heard of. It's called Chess Steps by Brunia and Weingarten, Dutch dudes. Wait, is that like the Chess Steps like program? Honestly, dude, I had never really heard of this thing, but I think it's kind of famous. It came out in the early 2000s, I think. Yeah, yeah, because Chess Steps is a yeah very famous program where it's like it's a bunch of books. It's like five or six yeah, it's, series right, it's of books. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, that's that's probably the one he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. It's hard to count this as like a, a single book. I would say it's more of just like a complete like uh, chess program. Like a competitor right. to chess steps is the dojo training program, basically. It's like that's how it's that's no, how but it's it positions, is. right? It's like you go through these positions, it's training you with positions. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It looks like their steps are broken down by rating up to yeah. 800, 800 yeah, yeah. to 1400, 1400 mm -hmm. to 1600. Yeah, so, so you I don't buy the book. You don't buy the book until, <laughs> until you get done with the step. You don't buy the next book until you're done with the first step one. Yeah, it's like very clearly laid out. I think it's also designed well for um, instructors that are teaching classes. Right, right. Um, it claims to be the world's leading teaching method in chess. So maybe they need to check out our program and then add a second. No, no, no. It's, it's very popular. It's very popular. No, no, no. We're, yeah, we're second to them. Okay. Well, the, the beauty <laughs> of that is like in terms of one of the things we just got to say too, right, is we decided we aren't going to talk about uh, like puzzle rush and all that kind of stuff we're talking about books but like what we have is simply enabled by technology that people back just 20 years ago like chess steps clearly didn't have um and now kids aren't reading books right and most adults aren't reading books too so we're talking about best books how we can bring them in the program but our program is clearly better <laughs> because the book is uh, nice it's a nice form but we have just more things going on here and interactions uh, via technology, right? We win. <laughs> we win. Uh, it, looks like, gonna... it looks like all they have is the tactics, Kostya. It's yeah, not a full training program for chess. It's just tactics. No, I, I believe they have end game stuff, um, positional puzzles. Mm, I'm sure. But it's all puzzles is what I'm trying, we're trying to say. I, okay. I feel like there's more to it, but you know, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a huge expert on it. So in number nine, I've got uh, Positional Play by Augard. I just finished that. Uh, I reviewed it on our site. Um, one of the things that I aspire to with our dojo training program book is that when we have a position before us, that it's not clear to the person looking at it, whether it's a positional move that they're looking for or a tactical move, a mix of both, Right. And um, puzzles, if you want to call them puzzles, that are often the most aesthetically pleasing to me are one where there's a positional solution. You know, usually there's some tactical ideas involved with it, too. But the aesthetic joy of a positional puzzle is really beautiful. And there's honestly not that many books that try to bring that out. So that's one of the things that I think that's kind of missing. Most of the books are really talking about tactical stuff, which is also important. Um, this book has the same problem as calculation, which is very, 90% of the problems are, are, are computer driven. Okay, so I get to go again. And my number eight is uh, the old ECO combinations book. So um, ECO was a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I might, Put my foot in my mouth there. It's a Serbian company, Yugoslavian, back in the day. And uh, they were putting out the informant. And the informant had all the top games uh, that were played in any given time span. And then at the end, the back of the book, they had a great collection of puzzles. And they had a great collection of end games, many of which were very difficult. And then the combination book. Also theoretical novelties also theoretical novels and they had a they then put that book together which was the first of its kind really um and it did break it down by motif some of it were was miscellaneous in the back so it was a great collection that basically 
every player of my generation went through that book several times. Uh, yeah, so that was, that's definitely a, a classic, the ECO combinations book. Yeah, one definitely. of the few books on your list that I've read. And I liked it. Nice. All right. Ben's Ben's number eight book, hmm. Jesse. Sorry, I was just I was like no, somebody no else is gonna go. No, I gotta go for Ben. I'm talking through Ben. <laughs> All good. So um Yeah, I love that you I was watching the stream earlier. I love that you um forced him at, at gunpoint on stream to give his top 10. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, they're all good. You know, I like this one. <laughs> no, okay, so like right. Me. I should say that <laughs> numbers 9 and 10 for Ben were meant for a lower audience. And this one, I think, is meant for a slightly more advanced audience. And that's Mastering Chess Strategy by mm -hmm. Helst, mm -hmm. which I haven't read yet. It's on my list. It's in our program. And my my reading list is strongly influenced by like what is in the program that I haven't read or haven't read recently, and I'm trying to reread it. Kosi, have yeah. you read that? Yeah, that's a great one. That's going to be on my list too. Um, I mean, it's focused on uh, positional elements, and like you said, there's very few like positional puzzle books out there. Um, that's one of them. That book is actually so massive in that it has an it's like an entire book of like positional examples, and then all the chapters have um, like a bunch of exercises attached to them as well. So it's like, um, yeah, really good training, and uh, yeah, I'll talk more about it later, I guess. Okay. Um, so when you guys said best puzzle books, you didn't just mean combinations, any kind of puzzle. Yeah, exactly. End game. End game sure. Positional. Yeah. Basically, be, David, where you get white's, it. It could be White's King is on H4 after four moves. How does Black give checkmate on move four? Yeah, it's a puzzle. I mean, it's still a puzzle. So like you get a position, you get asked to think about it and give your answer. Yeah. Okay. Because there's like that book of like Sherlock Holmes puzzles, you know? Uh, see, he's starting to count. Wheels are starting to turn, Costa. He might end up giving us some books. <laughs> No, I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm just I'm just understanding your proposition. <laughs> I really just thought, you know, we're uh, just learning tactical combinations here. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, there, there's positional <laughs> puzzle books. There's also a lot of variety within just, like, the, the tactical books, you know. Like, mm -hmm. there's a big difference between a book like, I don't know, Chess Tactics from Scratch, which is going to have, like, more instruction versus a book like... Um, that's just all puzzles where it's just diagrams and solutions um, and like less. But anyway. Yeah. Okay. So Eugene's, so Eugene's mm -hmm. book and Nate Solon's, their book about evaluation, that's a puzzle book. Yeah, for sure. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that would count. Yeah, there's well, a lot you of... You guys should put it on the list then because, I mean, there's exercises. only so many books about evaluating. Like none. Boss, if you want to make a list... You are welcome to make yeah. a list. You can't tell that's us what to put on our list. That's that's <laughs> crossing the line. <laughs> uh, it's like I'm not hungry, but can you guys order some fries? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not hungry. I'm not. <laughs> that's exactly what it is. <laughs> uh, okay, so my my number eight book here. Um, I'm basically going to put. Um, I'm going to put calculation slash positional play. Okay. I'm just going to put both of them because um, they're both Agard. Um, and they're very different books, but they're uh, they're from the same series and same same style. Um, <coughs> and okay, I was I was biting my <laughs> tongue earlier when, <laughs> when Jesse was talking, but um, I really like these books. I think they're they're good. Um, one thing I want to say is that calculation in particular, like it has uh, a lot of just instructive value. Like it's not just um, a bunch of exercises, but there's like examples and, you know, suggestions, techniques, like how to calculate, like what kind of moves to look for, what the thought process should be like. Um, so I, I personally feel like it's a very, very instructive book. Um, positional play as well. Um, actually, funny story about positional play. This was my suggestion for the dojo training program. Um, cause this book was suggested to me by, um, okay. A couple like strong players and, um, I really liked it. And, and then we had this conversation like multiple times 
um, where either David or Jesse were like, why do we have this in like our tactics section, like positional play? And I'm like, yeah. We kept trying to explain them. Like it's, it's like a, it's like a puzzle book. It's like exercises you got to calculate. Um, and a lot of the exercises, especially for Agard, um, are uh, very, very concrete in terms of the, the solution. So it might be like a positional idea, like you're improving one of your pieces, you're making an exchange, um, but they're, you can't justify the move without having calculated variations behind it, which is very important in, in chess and definitely um, should, be, should be trained. Um, yeah, I think I definitely feel the criticism that some of the puzzles just feel like too computery. It's just like, oh, that's too concrete. And it's like mm -hmm. unrealistic to kind of find that. But for the most part, I, I do find the puzzles in, uh, quite, quite instructive. Um, so, okay, that's my number eight. Kostya, how do you feel about Jesse's point about the book that it's too computer driven? Um, well, I just said that I think some of the puzzles are like a little too concrete in terms of the solution. Mm -hmm. But I think for the most part, like they're, uh, they're, they feel pretty instructive to me. But you think it's like a problem if positions are found in that way? Like based on like something that, that no person noticed, but that a computer noticed? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I think I'm not sure either. That's why I'm asking you. I think it's a tough question. Like I've been wondering about it a lot yeah. this morning since I didn't have books to rank. I was just thinking about some of these general questions like should your stuff, should you computer check all the answers or should you computer generate your puzzles? <laughs> right. Um, well, I think a lot of these, for example, are found, um, for instance, like sometimes it's like a blunder. Someone doesn't see a winning idea. And then that's kind of the puzzle. But I, I think if you show that puzzle to a strong player, they would often find it. It's just that a lot of times it's like we, we live in this like chess 24 era, right? Where it's like if someone misses something or if there's a nice tactic, they just like immediately post it and like everyone sees the solution. And of course, it's very obvious once you see the answer, right? So it's not like mm -hmm. these puzzles are given a chance. But to me, for the most part, a lot of them do feel realistic. It's it's not a co common that I get the feeling that like, oh, no one would ever see this or this was impossible to find. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, I think it's, it's quite doable. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to mention a little bit on this line is that <clears throat> the interesting thing that chess.com did with its puzzle survival and puzzle rush is those, comp those puzzles are computer driven but the level of the problem gets humanized in an interesting way just by the fact that they have so many people doing it that they can assign basically ratings for each puzzle, which then means that if the position that the computer found some answer to is ridiculously hard for a human, it'll end up having a very high rating. So that's not an answer to the quandary that we just placed, but it shows how these problems can evolve. Um, and probably beyond, evolve beyond the book form, right? Like for yeah. example, we do our puzzle book. Uh, I would really like to do something similar where, for example, in the first run, when we have, when we have people uh, put a problem into our database, by the way, if you just go to our database, uh, you can see our, 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 our excuse me, go to our homepage and anybody can input a puzzle there on the training tab for um, this problem database. And in that, there'll be a query for what level do you think the problem is at? And, you know, people will say 2,000, 1,800, whatever. But then if we tested it with enough people, it would then become really interesting to say, okay, this problem is around X level, right? So that's my hope anyway, about what a good puzzle book could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely more human generated stuff is is the best. Um, to answer the question, like I don't have a problem if the computer points out a win as long as it's like, um, you know, kind of looked at with human eyes and can be explained in in human um, in human words. Um, I feel like, actually, I think for lower levels, I would say the online tactics trainers are, are definitely like just as useful as books because it's like you just need to find like a simple tactic it's just about patterns 
there's not a lot of depth to the puzzles. I think it's more at higher levels where you do need puzzle books because it's like it's not just about finding the right move, but you also had to calculate out the lines correctly and you had to see like the relevant variations. And then a lot of times you have to evaluate a distant position correctly as well. Sometimes that's the hardest part of the puzzle, not seeing that you can sacrifice an exchange or whatever, but then evaluating three moves later that it's a good sacrifice. Um, whereas for lower levels, it's really more about just seeing a bunch of tactical patterns in different situations, being able to recognize those patterns quickly. And it's like one, two, three move tactics at most. You don't quite need as much like explanation as you would get um, in a book. Yeah, definitely. I got I got stuck on a Shanklin puzzle last week for like 20 minutes or something like that. And I'd seen the correct variation in the first five seconds. But <laughs> but the resulting position I thought was maybe slightly better. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how good a position we were supposed to have. Right. So I kept looking for like 20 minutes. Like, isn't there some like knockout some something? And finally, I was like, let me really evaluate the position at the end of my other variation. And I finally decided it was clearly better not slightly better you know but like i just spent 20 minutes stuck and i wasn't really doing any calculation the whole time <laughs> yeah so it's, it's tough it's very tough oh it's i have calculation, calculation here by the way on the on the i forgot i had it right here so that's what that's what it looks like mm. great series overall also there's strategic play which goes even further than positional play because it's like strategic decisions that are also possibly very concrete um, and then mm -hmm. endgame play, I, I think, is is good, too, with a bunch of uh, sharp endgame puzzles. Um, okay, shall I keep moving? Number seven? Yeah, let's keep it moving. All right, my number seven book um, is more of a, I don't know what to call it, modern, recent classic? Relatively recent. I, I don't know how people would consider it. Um, Imagination in Chess mm. by Gaprindashvili, uh, who I believe is a international master, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> Um, first name Pata. Uh, so yeah, this is this is a really interesting book. Um, there are definitely there are definitely some issues with it in that about half the puzzles are are incorrect, maybe l less than half. <laughs> so, so it has it has some issues for sure. Um, what I really like about this book is that it's a very unique book in that it focuses on. I, I think some of like just the trickiest aspects of calculation. Um, so a lot of the, there's just a couple of chapters, but in general, the chapters are about kind of finding very unexpected resources um, and just like moves or ideas that are uh, for whatever reason uh, difficult to, to see. Um, so things like in between moves, backwards moves, backwards um, moves combinations where you, uh, for example, give a check with your queen, the king moves, and then you retreat with your queen next. And now you have like this fancy double attack. So stuff that's just like very tricky to see, even one or two movers um, that, yeah, I've worked with this book a lot. I've given a lot of its puzzles to like my students. You know, the solution will be two moves long, but yeah. very, very hard, hard to see. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just a great book with a lot of very um, unique puzzles. Gaprindashvili is also the first one to put a name um, to this thinking that technique uh, that he refers to as uh, uh, reciprocal thinking, which is a technique I think a lot of strong players use when you're like calculating a line and it doesn't quite work. And then you realize, oh, if I just started with this move on move one, then the whole variation plays out correctly. And I think this is one of the only books that has a ton of puzzles on this theme where it's like you have an obvious idea or some idea that's not quite working. You have to start with a very non-obvious move and then your combination um, works from there. So very, very few books that even discuss this topic, but I think it's super, super common and uh, like... Yeah, lots of games are decided because some player had like this kind of um, this kind of instinct. So, um, but but yeah, should be said. Uh, you know, I, I think the book isn't fully computer accurate. Um, there are some positions where there's like multiple solutions, and it's kind of confusing what you're supposed to be looking for. Um, some of the positions aren't like uh, quite correct. Uh, some of the puzzles are weird. But I I still think you get you you get more than what you pay for with with the book so definitely worth um worth checking out i'd say for definitely for higher rated players like at least 1900 2000 feet a. i think Costa, you could even bump it up a little bit in your rankings if you want you could put it 
one or two higher. It's a good book, I, uh, it really sold it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's just the prize joke. But um, but. <laughs> this is this is okay. I've read a bunch of puzzle books, and for the most part, they all just were all kind of the same to me. This is one that actually did stand out a little bit to me as being different from others. Um, and it's because of what you said that it's got these like one or two move puzzles that are hard to solve. And you're like, what? Like, what? <laughs> like, and sometimes it's just, it's just a concept. It's not even a variation. It's not like, you know, it's just like, oh, you retreat the piece and on the next move you come back forward. It's like, it's just so <laughs> weird. It's hard to even explain, but that you can stump, you know, 2,400 level players with a two move variation with no side variations, you know, it's just very, very weird. So for anybody who's stuck in sort of like a rut or needs to expand their ability to see candidate moves or as it says, imagination, right? Like yeah. it's a great one for that, for sort of expanding you. Um, as far as computer checking, that's another question I was thinking about today. Like, should you computer check? And I actually think that for like game collections, I prefer books that are not computer checked. Um, because I think it helps you stay engaged as you're playing through a book and discussions of ideas if you can actually disagree with it with what's in the book and it like encourages you to actually be thinking for yourself, right? But if you're doing tactics, I think I'm going to come down on the side of it should be computer checked at this point because there's not like lengthy discussions, right? There's just a variation generally that tells you the answer. Some people will give some explanation, but if they're not going to mention the alternative solution that you might have thought of, you're just left just like confused forever, you know, and it's not, I don't know. To me, that's not a pleasant experience. Well, then, I mean, I definitely see what you're saying. I, I honestly don't mind it as much. I feel like, um, okay, ideally a book has as few mistakes as possible, especially like a tactics book. But if you have like a thousand problems or something or 300 problems, like a few of them are messed up, you know, I think that's that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I would also say that like and I've had this experience where, uh, you know, you're solving a puzzle and you feel like it doesn't really make sense. You haven't found the solution. And then you check you check the answer and it turns out the book was labeled wrong. It was mm -hmm. the other side to move. And mm -hmm. and then it's just like ah. you just wasted 20 minutes calculating like the wrong yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the wrong turn. Um, but I feel like that's still useful because you can still check your analysis against the computer and you might, maybe you're like, if your analysis was correct and that there is no advantage with whatever position you were calculating, maybe you had the wrong position, the position set up, there's a wrong diagram or whatever. I, I think that if someone said like, no good analysis goes unwasted, right? So as long as you still analyze the position objectively, like, I think that's, uh, it was still a very useful yeah. exercise and then um the other thing is like if you find a hole in the book like you see multiple wins or you know the solution presented is like oh i thought that wasn't working because of this and this and then you check the engine and it turns out you're mm -hmm. correct well you did kind of solve the puzzle it's like you went above and beyond really i mean it's like so i think um i would suggest kind of like engine checking your analysis when it's like the book doesn't mention <laughs> you know what you were saying or you're, you're disagreeing with the book or something's unclear and Mm -hmm. Hopefully it, it helps a bit. Right. But as far as how good a book it is, I think that's taking away from it a little bit. Like if you're reading a book on a train or whatever, I mean, you don't you don't always have, you know, Fritz in your pocket to yeah. to to go and double check stuff, right? Often a chess book is something that you read in a park or on a train and the on the go. I'm gonna give a whole rant later, David, as to why I think it's in fact the opposite is true. Okay. Books who to do it. not have computer checked are better better okay better cool i'm i'm looking forward to hearing it because i was just thinking about it today really hard for the first time uh, as far as puzzle books mm -hmm. i mean i have a strong opinion about not puzzle books so yeah okay next one is forcing chess moves this is ben's book i i've heard of this book i have not read it um so it is by Herton and benjamin a lot of people have said good things about this book yeah. So, I, yeah, that probably that, all, all all four so far. I can imagine somehow incorporating them into our program. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I was doing the thing. It's it got is. the big, uh -huh. it's got the big okay. arm. Yeah. See, David's been doing some puzzles on the side, Bows. It's a good book. I didn't say I don't like do puzzles. I've done so many puzzles. It's all kind of blended together for me. Like uh -huh. imagine imagination chess is one of the few that sticks out for me. 
mm-hmm. as being That's different than the others. David's number one, forcing chess moves is the number two. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good one. All right, Jesse, you're number seven. So my number seven is domination. And maybe I'll just say quickly on top of what Kostya said, uh, I got this book, came into my hands, you know, it was way before the computer. And it is a very difficult, like exceedingly difficult problems. There's a common aesthetic to them, though, like, dude only put problems in that fulfilled a certain beauty. Mm-hmm. And so one of the nice things about that is that um, you get a sense into an experience of an aesthetic of problems. And um, in general, I should also mention they are mostly what we would call endgame studies. And <clears throat> endgame studies have their own special kind of beauty, right? That other kinds of ones don't simply because with less pieces, you can actually get longer and more interesting variations than you can with middle game positions. And just to clarify, like a lot of times in say books like Calculation by Augard and others, you can end a variation by saying white has a crushing attack. Um, You cannot end you cannot end an endgame puzzle like that. You can end it with like, well, white's up a piece or something, right? But uh, or white is a winning position. But it's not. You you can't do that kind of qualitative thing with an endgame study. Okay, so domination, and then at number six, I might move these around again. Um, I have endgame tactics by Van Parallel, which I read fairly recently, very much enjoyed, and. <clears throat> There's diff- lots of different endgame books, and I'll talk, we're going to, it'll be at least one more on my list. Endgame Tactics is really nice in the sense that it's not what we would call theoretical positions, but positions taken from actual games where this guy, Van Perlo, was collecting endgame positions for decades, and um, human analysis um, but I think very well checked by him and maybe some other people who read the manuscript. Um, published after his death in terms of the big thing that we now have. And it really gives a sense of the beauty of endgames on a practical level. Not just so not, we're not talking about endgame studies. We're not talking about theoretical endgames. We're just talking about endgame positions where violence is happening. <laughs> and this book kind of opens up the breadth of violence in the end game. So really nice book. Okay, cool. I get to keep going because of this, uh, because I got um, uh, Johnson on tap two. And so he has got a book that I'm certain will be coming up later, Perfect Your Chess. So I won't say much about it, since I'm sure Kosti and I will mention it on our list. Too. Yeah, perfect your chess. Very good book. Mm-hmm. Yep, good book. Okay, um, Kosa, what do you got, buddy? Okay, number six for me um, is uh, basically a series of books. I'm just going to put the series title. Uh, it's called The Manual of Chess Combinations. Um, <laughs> we've so far, we've only got one book in common. <laughs> <laughs> You know why? <laughs> it's tough. It's tough. Um, Here's Kostya's little Russian schoolboy side. Yeah, yeah, chess school. So there's a couple of these books. There's a one A, one B, a two, volume three. Um, but basically, they're all good. They're meant for for different levels. I think one A is up to like eight hundred or so. One B is like eight to twelve hundred, and and so on and so forth. Um, but really, really good books, really good puzzles. I feel like they're they're very thematic puzzles. They're combinations where like the themes will come up over and over again, um, and they do a great job of mixing in um, some endgame studies early on, or at least like excerpts of endgame studies that are are quite simple. So just kind of throwing in those like cute little endgame ideas um, at a at a lower level, I think, is very very useful, and it gives people very uh, solid foundation and then in the more advanced 
books in the series and they throw in like actual in-game studies um, that are of course hard to solve but appropriate for for that level um, and uh, yeah just again um, ooh, really good good combinations they're all taken from like classic games um, for the most part I actually think the book was done um, was like human selected uh, I mean like the puzzles were uh, handpicked by by a human because I think there's like a few computer mistakes um, but very very clean for um, for the large majority of puzzles and also I want to say one of the later books I think it's volume three has some really good sections for stronger players um, like in particular they have a chapter um, that's called finding uh, difficult moves in calculation and it's great because it's like all of the combinations start off with like maybe one two three obvious moves and then on move four you have to find just like a really hard hard move um, which I think is a very very uh, useful um, thing to train there's another chapter it's all about the um, opponent's counterplay and it's it's literally a chapter of puzzles where um, either you're like you're white to play you're black to play and they ask you to evaluate a move and the move doesn't always work out so you simply have to calculate it out and in every puzzle there's always like uh enemy resources and either the idea doesn't work or it does work but you have to then calculate and figure out why so it's just like really um really good training and it really deals with this thing that people run into where it's like you know when you know it's a puzzle you always know it's, there's like a solution and it's like okay this should work this should work but if you don't know that it's supposed to work then it of course it makes it a lot harder and forces you to actually analyze um, a lot more effectively. So yeah, great series of books overall um, there. And uh, let me go to my number five pick, um, which, um, oh, is, yeah, speaking of, is going to be uh, actually a more recent Dvoretsky book um, called Recognizing Your Opponent's Resources, which I've actually been doing recently. I'm working through it right now. Um, and it's great. Uh, Dvoretsky actually hasn't done... Uh-oh. I'm going to have to... I'm just going to shorten it. Um, Dvoretsky hasn't done a bunch of puzzle books. Most of his books are kind of like example-based uh, with some with some exercises. Um, but this is one which, which has a ton of puzzles. Like, where uh, basically I'm... I haven't even finished chapter one yet. And it's like, I think it's like 180 problems in chapter one. There's like multiple chapters, um, but great book. Very, very unique in that it's all about finding the opponent's resources. Um, so all of the puzzles are taken from like real games and real situations and uh, very, very practical. And every puzzle, it's like, it's not enough to find the winning idea. You have to find like why another obvious idea doesn't work. Um, in many cases, there's no best move in the puzzle. You just have to find a safe move because every, let's say, aggressive idea is refuted. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so very, very difficult. But personally, I found it like exceptionally useful. Um, and it's actually a book, I, you know, I, I've already put it on our list. I think we should consider adding to the program for the, the higher cohorts. Um, it's also got like a lot of endgame studies where this is a theme where, you know, you have multiple ideas in an end game, but two of them don't work because of just some uh, crazy resource that you have to find. And uh, yeah, I just feel like it's great for your calculation. And there are very few books like this, right? Most puzzle books are just about like, okay, white to plain win, find the forcing move, boom, boom, and you're done. Here it's like very, very practical where you have to see the opponent's ideas. You have to understand like why an obvious move isn't working. And um, you'd be surprised, you know, at first glance, it's like, if you're told that some move isn't working, you think you'd be able to figure out why, just knowing that the move is wrong. Even knowing that the move is wrong, it can still sometimes be very, very hard. And it's very frustrating staring at a position for 20 minutes. You see that a pawn is hanging. You know there's something wrong with it. You can't figure, you can't figure it out. And then you see the solution and you're just like, oh my God, unbelievable. So yeah, really, um, really high level book there. All right, that's, uh, that's it for me. Yeah, I want to say, Kosi, because Kosi, so Kosi wants to add it to the program, to the upper cohorts. And so I have it on my shelf here. So that's on my... Uh, oh, you got it. Oh, yeah, I have it, it here. I'll show people the cover. There we go. Okay. 
What so, would you say would be the lowest rating for using that book, Kostya? Um, I think like starting around 2100 is good because the chapter does start off on the easier side and then towards the end it gets starts to get very, very difficult. Um, but yeah, I've been, <laughs> I've been working with this book with, uh, with Tadev and we've been, yeah, uh, struggling, struggling through it. <laughs> Very, Jesse, very can tough. I ask you the same question about Van Perlo? Does it have any basic tactics in it? Like, does it teach you, you know, when you've got a pawn on a7 and rook on a8, if the black king is on the seventh rank, that you can go rook h8 and queen your pawn because of rook h7? Does it have basic no, like, stuff in it, or does it start like with Like I really said, that's tough? theoretical stuff. A lot of the stuff is easier tactics that somebody missed in a game. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, no theoretical stuff. Um, I should also mention, I'm having some doubts about putting it on six, just because, not because it's not a great book, but in the sense that it's arguably not a puzzle book. I, I think what, interestingly, Chessable turned it into a puzzle book, but honestly, the positions, maybe they're more meant to be played through, because a lot of times you see a position and then somebody makes a mistake right there. So it's not like you're trying to find the mistake. So I might, I might uh, move one of Kostya's books over, change it up a little bit. Like you've had Kostya and I end game sensei, at least one position from Van Perlo. True. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that hard uh, pawn end game. They were a ridiculously difficult yeah. pawn end game. But that's just because you said the ridiculous thing that you could figure out any pawn end game. And I was like, boss, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, so I have to go uh, myself. I'm gonna go twice here. Wait, I think you skipped over. You put Ben's pick in, but you didn't say it out loud. Oh, I hadn't said anything. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah. Number five for Ben is Chess Tactics from Scratch by Vedishnik, and that's I, I I read that book, reviewed it here on the site. You can check that out. And we added that to a couple cohorts. I think 15, 16, 1700 has chess tactics from scratch. Um, it's kind of, uh, it, its ambition is to talk about ways of finding tactics for kind of that level. In addition to showing puzzles, uh, there's like 300 puzzles at the end. And at the end of every chapter, there's a set of puzzles that deal with whatever theme that the chapter was dealing with. And you know, <clears throat> one of the things, of course, about doing the dojo is I would normally not be reading that book for myself, but I did enjoy that a lot. And I was like, oh, right, this helps me understand, too, what a good puzzle book looks like for a lower cohort, right? And like I said, for my own personal list, I'm just doing books that touched my soul aesthetically and in terms of playing strength. Um, by the way, this might be the time at number five to give our little spiel. Uh, <clears throat> end game puzzles, okay? Or excuse me, puzzles in general, especially tactics puzzles, especially end game studies, I will say, can be very addictive. They are, it's a beautiful thing to do, and it is turned into its own competitive sports. There are puzzle solving competitions. So it's not just chess anymore. Uh, about, not just about improving your chess. It is a, a pursuit in its own. And it's been that way, honestly, for a, wh a while, but it hasn't turned into a competitive thing such as it is, is now. And the reason I want to stress that is there is a strong argument. <clears throat> now, let's just take the, the the straw man's case because my friend Yermolinsky, Alex Yermolinsky, has a very powerful argument, which is at least, even if you disagree, you need to hear it, <clears throat> which is that puzzles are garbage, because all of the tactics are in your own games and you are just going somewhere else instead of looking deeply where you should be looking, right? So it's just a little game that you're playing on the side. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting argument. I don't entirely agree, but it's important to hear because I can say about myself that I enjoy puzzles. I've done a lot of puzzles and it's its own, it can definitely be its own kind of um David, I'm, I have the German word Zeitvertreib. What do we say? Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what? <laughs> I forgot the English word. That's hilarious. Appreciation. 
No, no, no. When you're no. just wasting time. You like know, a time sink or something. A time sink. Yeah, we're, oh, me and David, we both don't remember the English word. In any case, you know, something you're like a the way crossword puzzles can be done, you know. Pastime? Okay, pastime. There you go. Okay, here we go. So, number five. <clears throat> I have got the book that I recently reviewed. I enjoyed a lot. Uh, and this, I think, help, this book helps us understand what a good puzzle book is. Maybe let's call it maybe the future of good puzzle books. And I'm not allowed into my little tab here. Here we go. Think like a super GM. This, I got turned on to this book by Ben Johnson when we were listing best books. Um, and it sets a new standard and helps also understand why engines aren't the best. So the new standard is this. <clears throat> Instead of giving an answer that's based in the computer, give the problem to a variety of people and have them, different skill levels, and have them describe how long it took them to do the problem or not do the problem, what their answer was, what their reasoning was. And especially for me, reading the way Adams solved the problem. Sometimes dude didn't get it right, which are also comforting for a chump GM like me. Um, really helped give me insight into how somebody who is a human mind, I can't aspire to be a, a computer mind, but how a human mind approaches a position and you know the efficiency with which Adams can discard things and I'm still you know, stuck spinning my wheels on some junk move, <laughs> you know, and then therefore, you know, the time you don't spend on things is very important in chess and in puzzles. The other thing that I think is very good about that book is that in contrast to just about every puzzle book, it gives great insight into the difference between um, how people solve problems or chess at different levels. And there's a lot to say about it, but I'll just take one takeaway that was kind of proven in the answers <clears throat> is that the main difference, and this applies not just for puzzles, but I think for chess in general, the main difference between lower rated players and higher rated players is when lower rated players see a good move, they have a very hard time not just doing it, just like just putting it out on the board or saying, that's my answer. I've seen that as a coach as well. Whereas higher rated players are gonna try to refute their own ideas and really go deep into that refutation. And honestly, when you look at Carlson, the way he talks, you can see so many times dude sees the right move instantly, but then we'll spend some time thinking about it, right? And doing a, a real deep blunder check about what's going on in the positions and the assumptions of the positions. So has more to say than that, but really great book in that regard. And like I said, I think it sets the stage for what problem books will become in the future. You have to have some kind of human element in terms of what's going on. You can't just be like Agard anymore and be like, well, the computer spit out this line. You know, no boss, no, give me more. Okay, and then uh, four, <clears throat> and here I have my rant that I've been saving for David. So number four is The Best Move by Yansa and Hort. And this is an old book, pre-computer. And so let me set the stage. A lot of these are tactics. A lot of them are positional moves, um, some end games. And the genius of this kind of book, and it's really important to see why computer books, computer solutions aren't as good, is that when Yansa and Hort say that they think a move is best. And they have had their bro GMs look at it several times too. Um, <clears throat> it's the human answer is what is interesting in that. So there's a lot of ones where, and, and let me say also as a reader, you can disagree. And if you want, you can turn on the computer and you can have a debate with these people. That's the beautiful thing. Now, if Jans and Hort were doing it today and they turned on their engine, well, instantly they would say, oh, of course I was wrong. But no, <laughs> you had deliberate thought 
about this, my friend. You thought it wasn't like you were some chump GM. No, you guys were at the top of your game, especially Hort. This, this was like one of the top players of his generation. So, yes, that is in a sense the answer. So even if you disagree, you get a sense of like, well, this is the human answer, right? And then you can disagree with it. And that's part of the fun, honestly, is having a disagreement, you know, and first, you know, the first thing you're going to do when you see their answer is you're going to say like, Maybe usually you'll just be like, oh, obviously I missed that. But sometimes you'll be like, wait a second, what about me, boss? <laughs> well, I had an idea here, buddy. And you could check it if you want or ask your friend and analyze it. So I think to, to me, the old books without the computer generated stuff are really good. Let me mention something that's not quite a puzzle book that can be used as a puzzle book. And that is in the program, we have Art of Attack. I'm really enjoying rereading that. If you look at that book and just consider the diagrams, it's essentially a puzzle book. So many of those answers are wrong. And I can, I've been going through it with Jamil, my student, and I can, I know instantly, I'm like, this is sus, this is sus. So we have a little debate and we look at it, look at it, look at it. And then if we want to, we can check it. Great, dude, great, yeah, fantastic. That's fun. And, then, and then the chumps on like Chessable and there's I, people on telling us on our Discord, they're reading it like on some chump FM went through it with a computer. and. You know, the Chump FM doing doing the editing will be like, well, actually, so-and-so and so-and-so. And, so and so. <laughs> I'm like, boss, actually, you're not the one talking here. It's some Chump computer you're talking to. Okay. Yeah. No, Rant that's, over. that's Rant no, over. I'm, I'm with you there, Jesse. Yeah, leave Vladimir Rokovich alone, all right? He wrote a brilliant <laughs> book. And it's like, no, but you're right, Jesse. It's just going through the book is what makes you a better player. It's not the computer-checked variations it's the ideas that are presented in the book the sacrifices learning how to judge attacks how to use your pieces how to find resources and very very good examples overall so yeah i can't get the oh ben johnson's next one to center maybe you can figure that out in any case fix it. uh let me ben let has, me suggest one thing okay. on that topic jesse i'm not mm -hmm. maybe not going to get into a full-fledged fight with you or anything because you mm -hmm. know you guys know in general i'm not super pro computer but um, this is actually sort of a counter to my own way of, of thinking in general in the past. But do you think it's possible that when we talk about what's a human move and what's a computer move, that that could be changing a little bit as more and more people are, are training up with computers? Like, for example, is it possible that things that we dismiss as, oh, it's a computer move, nobody would see it, that people of the type of like, you know, Nodirbek Abdusadarov might, might see it? in this coming generation that that there might be a degree to which people are going to see more and more computer moves as there are more and more humans who've trained with computers um let me i'll put it like this it definitely has been the case over my lifetime and i'll just try to retreat in time for a second that when uh i was a kid and we were reading annotations the the games when you're reading annotations often had a, a narrative arc like so and so was a better player and had this strategy and yeah. crushed somebody else and uh there was kind of a beauty in that and there was kind of like a priesthood in that like oh this dude's on a whole nother level and has this deep strategic conception now with the computer the computer is really showing us actually if you look at that game both sides were making mistakes and it was a more on a move by move basis in the sense that the, the valuation was actually changing dramatically and these chumps never realized. <laughs> so the computer has moved us to more of a move by move analysis of the position. Move by move meaning that the old ideas of a strategic conception of the board, which then carried out through multiple phases of the game, doesn't didn't exist like the old masters actually thought. And that leads to a more uh, computer -y way of thinking about it. Just you're like, well, every move, every move, I might have something here. Let's go. You know, let's look deeply at it. So I think that's the biggest shift. But when we look at specific problems, like the ones in, let's say, calculation by Agar, I mean, he's looking at, you know, he's like, MBL missed this one. What a chump. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, boss, <laughs> come on. MBL is just as computer driven as everybody else. You know, so um, is, is it true, by the way, that once you know that the computer found something, 
that even a chump GM like me can be in like, okay, wait a second, the computer found something here and then maybe I can find it, of course, mm -hmm. right? But that's a slightly different thing. In the real game, you don't know. You don't know, maybe you, you have no idea. Once the computer tells you something there, it's something different. Yeah, all right. Shall we keep going? Let's keep going, Bows. All right, number four for me, um, maybe a bit controversial. I'm going with um, Woodpecker Method uh, by Smith and Antikinen. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of discussion about this book. I apologize, I'm not gonna spell Tikkanen correctly. I'm just not, I just don't remember, um, but I'll do my best. Um, there's a lot of discussion about this book because whenever it's like you hear Woodpecker Method, it's like people are like, oh, is the method good? Is it, is it a good method? Does it work? And it's like, the book is actually more than just the method. That's the thing I'm like trying to, I always try to like share it. It's like, so the book is essentially 1100 um, tactical puzzles or combinations. They range from like easy all the way to hard. I would say the easy ones start off like, 15, 1600, and then they, they go up to maybe like 2200 or so, maybe a bit harder. And um, so it's like 1100 um, really well selected puzzles. All the puzzles are like computer checked. Um, they pretty much exclusively have like one solution in the puzzle, which, um, you know, is, is not off, always the case. Or if there's multiple solutions, you know, all the annotations are really like instructive and the solutions are often. Um, what I like about the book is that it tells you like what you need to have seen in advance to give yourself full credit for the puzzle, which I think is really important. The author is like, you have to see this line and this variation and this thing. Um, and all the puzzles are also taken from the games of world champions, which I think is just cool. So as you're doing the book, you're getting to solve like combinations from everyone from like Steinus all the way to, to Carlson. Um, and sometimes they're on the winning side, sometimes on the losing side, but I think that's just kind of good for, for chess culture. So you end up seeing a lot of these classic games um, and combinations. Um, and then at the beginning of the book, it's like three pages, the authors also share a method for working through the puzzles that worked for them, they think could be fun. And it's like yeah. people are just so hung up on this first like three pages at the beginning of the book, you know, they don't realize it's like, it's actually just like a very good puzzle book just without this like suggested method. And so the method is cool. It's like, all right, you do as many puzzles as you can in four weeks, then you try to do the same set in two weeks, then the same set in one week. Eventually you do your your first set, whatever you did in that first four weeks, eventually you try to do it in one day. Um, and then they suggested if you're a strong player, like FMI, I'm trying to go for GM, you should try to do the whole book. Um, not everyone has to do the whole book. You can do less puzzles, but I remember doing the whole book. I was like, I think I was IM already. Yeah, I was IM already. And I ended up doing the whole thing in, in one day. And absolutely, like, you know, a few weeks later, I just felt like uh, my calculation had improved. I was seeing a lot more. I was a lot sharper, a lot quicker. So, you know, people ask like, okay, is it better than just doing six weeks of tactics from a different source or six weeks of tactics from a different book? Like, do you really need to do this method? The thing is, no one's doing the six weeks of tactics. They're just arguing about like what, <laughs> what method is the best. It's like, this is actually a fun way to like get yourself to do the tactics. It's inherently competitive because every time you're doing the cycle, you wanna get a higher and higher accuracy as you're doing the puzzles. And it's just mm. like a great way to get you to do a bunch of calculation in an uh, intense um, period of time. So for me, it's like, it's just a great book. Whether or not you follow the method, I think honestly doesn't matter that much, but I, I think it's, um, yeah, it has a lot, of, uh, a lot of things going for it. My favorite part of that coast was that I could feel the internet controversy just in the vehemence in which you were defending this book. <laughs> I could yeah. feel all the people, people have been arguing about this online. Man. Like, it's just, yeah, it's like, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's hardly important. <laughs> uh, okay, so with that out of the way, let me get to... Um, my number three book. This is actually a repeat. Um, ben had this one on his list. Um, I'm going with the uh, the Halstein book for my number three, uh, Mastering Chess Strategy. Um, we mentioned this book has a lot of good uh, positional puzzles. I also think his other books are good, Mastering Endgame Strategy and Mastering Opening Strategy. They're all written in a very similar format. 
in that it's a bunch of like instructive examples and then it's a bunch of exercises as well at the end. So all three of those books are good. I would say like Mastering Chess Strategies, maybe the, the main one. So um, I'll give that the, uh, the number three pick from, uh, from me. Okay. All right, so Ben has five, three, three, four, Pogar. Now, David is still too proud to read this book, but it is a classic. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when I do my top three. I was also too proud. So um, as with a lot of our, when we do these beautiful lists, I have a lot of fun doing it. We, players, games, oftentimes, and this is the case here, uh, my top three I can feel are a little bit interchangeable on any given day. So just bear that in mind that I can imagine flipping these out. So at number three, I have uh, Perfect Your Chess and a uh, great book. We've talked about this on a variety of other shows. Um, the thing I will say now about it is that it's uh, <laughs> the, the, the human component to this was that this guy, Grabinski, this is a Ukrainian coach back in the day, um, would show, would do really the chess training that that dude did was really having a bunch of competitive young players come in and have them do different positions, mostly calculation training. And these positions that he's showing us are the fruit of that labor, like the just the best ones from that, ordered then kind of by um, skill level. And also then the, the best ones, not only in terms of, let's say, uh, return of investment in your time, but also a lot of positions which just have, uh, let's say, mind-expanding beauty to them. And that's one of the things that I'm really looking for when I, when I say that a book, a puzzle book, connects with me aesthetically or spiritually or something like that when you can show me some positions and then have some explanation that are like oh yeah i get it and i think the book was ultimately computer checked but really it was like pruned heavily by human interaction with grabinski and his students okay yeah, rant over <laughs> uh, number two i have very five. good book jesse that's one of the few that i've Oh, maybe you're going to want to do your own list, boss. No, no, no. I just say it's a good <laughs> book. I'm not saying it's better or worse than than like <laughs> Domination by Kasparian. It's just another good book. Okay. So um, I then put the Polgar book at number two. And let me just say, like David, I had an attitude about the book first. I was like, oh, I'm too good for this book. I'm already, I was already an I am at the time. I was like, I don't need it. Um, and ultimately, it's an example of how you can get better by teaching because I was using it first as because I was doing coaching with kids and I would be using the positions there. And at a certain point, I was like, oh, this is great. And then I just started doing it. And since that time, I've done it several times through. And if we're going to talk about woodpecker method, it's kind of interesting. And essentially, I've done the book so many times that I, you know, I could essentially do it faster and faster. I'll, it still won't be instant for me, right? Um, but, you know, yeah, I've, I've done it again and again, and it really helps. Uh, and this, I think one of the interesting things about the poll, the training program actually is uh, at the beginning, I was like, oh, people are really going to get mad at this. They're not going to understand it. But I, I really pushed for it in the program. And people have been into it. They're like, and they're kind of d saying what I've, got out of it the first time, which was visualization in general, not just for mating patterns, but then the mating patterns themselves really drilling it down. And I feel it's like a basketball layup. You need to be able to hit it from a variety of very delicate angles. And there's going to be a bunch of nuance in that little, in the finish, in the finish, which is the mate. Uh, so yeah, I'm really into that book. Definitely one of the books helped me become a GM. We have a video review that I did about last year or so about that. And then Ben Johnson, let's keep going. Um, he has his number two, a book that I haven't, I had heard of actually, but I, I didn't, um, I hadn't done anything with. And that is 
Practical Chess Exercises mm. by Cheng. And this came out like 2007 or so. I haven't read it, but he was really pumped on it. And this is, um, <clears throat> and um, he said it was meant for about 13 to 1700. And, and one of the things actually me and Kosia argue a little bit about with these puzzles is Kosia likes it if the themes are kind of organized like pins and skewers. And I'm like, yeah. no boss, it can't be that way. I don't like, anyways, this has mixed themes without prompts that he was really into. And other people have spoken highly of this book. I don't have any experience with it, but definitely <clears throat> it's, you know, Ben, I, like I said, is really knowledgeable about books. So all of these I'm going to probably get in it and check out. Yeah, I've seen a bit of that book. I think, yeah, it has a good mix of puzzles, like both strategic and tactical, sometimes a mix of both. Um, so, yeah, yeah that's, that's good praise. That's high ranking um, for sure. Okay, uh, number two for me, um, I have uh, a repeat, Perfect Your Chess. Um, just a really, yeah, really awesome book, especially for, for players on the higher rated side. A lot of great um, uh, exercises, very much a mix of like strategic and um, tactical themes, but also like a lot of puzzles have um, difficult evaluation element attached as well. Um, and they all come from um, just high level games. I also like that it uses a bunch of modern examples, so it doesn't have you know all the same kind of classic combinations that you might see in other books. Um, and yeah, just yeah, just overall, just very like I don't want to say like it was like a groundbreaking book or anything, but it, it really kind of like I don't know. I feel like it changed the nature of puzzle books once that book came out. It was like a pre perfecture chess world and a post perfecture chess world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember a lot of very strong players saying like, "Oh yeah, this is the book to like work on." Um, I studied it with a couple other title players um, back in the day. I feel like it helped me a lot get from like twenty two to, to twenty three hundred and, and higher. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, just very human situations, very very well selected puzzles for for sure. So. Um, awesome book. I hear they're coming out with a new version soon, which is exciting, or perhaps a new a new book by Grabinski, mm -hmm. I feel like has mm -hmm. been in the works, so hopefully that comes out soon. Um, I also wanted to say the authors of The Woodpecker Method are soon going to be doing a sequel of The Woodpecker Method. Chat reminded me, so thank you guys for that. They're doing a Woodpecker Method with positional puzzles that's supposed to be released later this year. And uh, I'm yeah, I imagine that book is going to be... Uh, Fantastic. So definitely a future, future Hall of Famer there. Um, okay. And then for my number one book. Do you guys realize that you're an hour and 15 minutes into this show and haven't really like argued about anything yet? You're just listing a bunch of books and they're all good. We argued a bit. You know, we, we said arguing, some, buddy. We were yeah. arguing, yeah, about like Agar, you know, uh, what else? Uh, you know, computers. Should computers be in? We can argue more. <laughs> <laughs> if you want i agree we should we should be arguing more <laughs> um okay number one book um to me just felt like the right pick i don't know why exactly but it just seems like it's so classic and it's so helpful i think for a very very wide range of players um that it deserved to be number one for me um and that is combinative motives by uh Motifs by Maxim Bloch. Um, so really, really classic book. Big old haven't heard of that one. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> I I bet you have. You know, in a in a way, because I feel like this. You probably is, heard of CT Art. Yeah, because like CT Art is based on that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, this is a book that's very interesting. It's really well organized. Basically, it's a bunch of tactical puzzles. Some of them are on the easier side. Some of them are definitely uh, longer, more challenging. But the puzzles will range from one or two move tactics to multiple variation combinations. Um, and what I uh, just enjoy in particular is I think the themes and the puzzles are very well selected. It's just a great job of um, teaching players the different tactical themes or motifs that make up combinations so things like attraction deflection removing the defender in between moves i mean all just like the classic um themes and the book is st structured in an interesting way where 
I don't think the puzzles are organized by theme or, or difficulty, but they're all kind of labeled. So you can see which puzzles are harder, which puzzles are easier, and then you can also see them according to the theme if you want. Or you can also solve them kind of like randomly, where you don't know what the theme is. And uh, yeah, I just, I just feel like going through this book um, would provide a bunch of players some very, very fundamental pattern recognition. Um, and as Jesse said, this book was then the basis of this really popular app that I'm a fan of called CTART. I think now they're up to CTART 6.0, but they had a bunch of iterations of it. And a lot of those puzzles come from, um, from this book and, and the, their apps and stuff are kind of organized in, uh, in a similar way. Um, but that's often like the main app that I recommend to people when I suggest to like work on their tactics. I also just, I, I done a video about that app. People can check it out why I like it so much, but like, yeah, the puzzles are well selected. It shows you why your solution is wrong. It lets you try the puzzle multiple times. So it doesn't just like give you the answer right away. Um, and then it doesn't have this huge defect in my opinion that most online tactics trainers have where the puzzles are like computer generated and it's like a computer solution and they don't even ask you for like the most critical lines and all this stuff. So this book, that app, I just feel like, uh, like bang for your buck, definitely like the best, definitely. Okay, cool. The next one, again, I didn't, I didn't know about this book. Maybe you guys know. It's called Winning Chess Exercises by Coakley. Mm -hmm. uh, it's for kids, actually. I should put in for kids. Uh, don't let that fool you. Still probably pretty hard or good or whatever you want to say. So, <laughs> dude, Ben Johnson's a winner, man. He knows. He, he knows about this <laughs> No, that's a good book. I've heard very good things about that book. Actually, I'm going to take away chess out of it because then I can, right, it'll be better space, just winning exercises for, I think that's what it's called, winning exercises for kids. Okay. <clears throat> and then my top book, like, again, I want to stress the uh, top three could, I could interchange them, is the Encyclopedia of Chess Endings by Kalinishenko. And uh, just quick story, kind of hilarious to think of where Russia is now, but I played the 2004 Aeroflot Open, and it was in this hotel that used to be right next to Red Square, where it, back in the day, like, that's where the CIA would be, and they would have, like, all these, like, spy things running through the walls and stuff. <clears throat> and so, anyways, I was at, that's where the, the tournament was, and that's where I bought that book. And then 2005... I spent basically the whole year doing that thing. And, and that is like a puzzle book. It's presented like, like puzzles. Yeah. So here's the book, by the way, I'm, this is not a oh, book cool. I'm recommending you buy. It costs $200 or something. It's got a Russian title, but it, since it's puzzles, you don't need to know Russian. Um, and it's organized by first, you know, pawn end games, rook end games, queen end games. And it's, uh, the, let me just say, back in the day, ECO created a big old series of books, like one book on pawn end games, one book on queen, you know, queen, one book bishop, one book knight. I think there were two books on rook end games, and those are interesting books. And unfortunately, I gave my copies away because I couldn't travel with them. I was poor, and I was like, I I can't keep carrying these around in my duffel bag. Okay. <laughs> what happened to those books but, but those books honestly what they did was it was too much it was too much they were just putting every single position in there and because it was then too much you didn't have the let's call it educational flow um that you need to progress like so you know let's start off with a certain type of pawn end game and let's move up the ladder and I really feel like it's a great example of how puzzles can really help you learn anything. So, for example, let's say the, the, the few times I've tried to learn physics, say, doing physics puzzles. Oh, man, you really get an understanding of visualization, what is going on. Same way with, let's say you want to learn the end game. You don't want to 
do a read some thing. I mean, it was helpful to read some things. No, you had to put the reps in doing loads of pro problems. And the thing about this one that I really like is it's not just the theoretical positions, but there's a loads of studies that are related to the uh, positions, the theoretical positions, right? And then there's lots of examples from practical chess play. So uh, those three books very much helped me. Perfect Your Chess, Polgar Book, Encyclopedia of Chess Endings. And um, when we have on the site, we have the, what I call the Rook Endgame Progression. And that's my own take a little bit on some of those positions in the Kalinichenko book where I've especially designed them for sparring, right? So this, even if you do not, will never get this book, if you're in the program and do the Rook Endgame Progression, the influence of this book is kind of in there in terms of getting positions let's say from the ground up and then developing it to a uh, harder and harder difficulty. Okay, David. So whose list is most correct in your view? <laughs> and we just have to like, do the final. Just like the books, list. they're more or less equal. Oh God. Why did you have to ask him? Coach? Why did you ask him? <laughs> Let's find out who's going to do. David has to do the math though. Cause he didn't do anything. I now think, he's got to do the math and figure it out. I think we're ready to go. I think David has, ready to go? has set it okay, up for us. Okay, good. So let me um let me grab the uh the final rankings real quick. We don't have a ton of repeats, so these aren't the most democratic rankings, I would say. But uh yeah. So what books were even on all I think there's two books on all three lists, right? We got oh, Prefecture yeah, Chess and Polgar. Oh, on, on all three chess. The top the top two are on all three lists. Mm -hmm. As far as I could tell, those were the only ones. And then there are a couple more overlaps near the bottom of the compiled list I did for you, but they were defeated by the books that people put in first and second that were uh, unique. So between five and eight, you've got four books that just got all their points from one person. <clears throat> and while Kosi is setting that up, we have an angry chat message about why we don't have How to Beat Your Data Chess. I read that book. It's in the program. Uh, so not dissing on the book. It's hard to make this list. It's hard. Yeah, to make a lot this of good list. books out there, folks. Yeah. Oh my god. I think that's the only good book we left out. Think again. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Chad can compile their disappointment in a list. You yeah. know, Just bring your bring your disappointment. Um, actually, another really good book I wanted to mention is um, book three of uh, Polgar's Learn Chess the Right Way series. It's also in our program, but. I really like this book because it's focused on defensive puzzles, um, which is very, very rare, especially for books um, that are meant for lower rated players. It's often like, you know, white to play and win, black to play and win. It's rarely you get puzzles where you have a checkmate, uh, your, like your king is being threatened, you have one way to defend against the mate or one way to save your pieces. Um, but, but those kinds of tactics are also, I mean, no less important than learning how to win stuff too. Yeah, um, that's great. I mean, to some ex to some extent, yeah. I value more highly books that cover something that's a little bit more rare, like that, right? Um, but does that make it like a better book? In some sense, it's just a book that you need more because there aren't alternatives to it. But you know, it could be equally d well done as far as you know the author's execution. Yeah, exactly. Well, there, um, there we go. There are our combined rankings. So in terms of chess for Philidor. <laughs> in terms of books that have more than one um, one person uh, pushing them, let's see. In tenth place, we have positional play from Agard, five points. Then we have domination, number nine, practical chess exercises, uh, Klinichenko, chess exercises for kids, uh, block combinator motives. Helstein in fourth place, Mastering Chess Strategy, me and Ben. Um, think like a super GM, that's Jesse and Ben's pick in third place. And in second place, we have the Polgar book. We all picked that one. Um, and in first place, we have Perfect Your Chess, taking the top, the top spot. Wow. That's great. Yeah. Exciting. That's a good list. Exciting. Okay, folks, you know what to do. If you disagree with the list, <laughs> You got to give us your own list, your own books. Um, let us know your favorites. I think we did okay. As yeah, far as I can tell, you only put good books on the list. Yes. So that's 
<laughs> that's <laughs> something. Yeah. Um, that was fun. That yeah. was fun. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. And we will, uh, we will catch you next time. <laughs>